story of the Irish Revolution has been told from the point of view of adults, but what was it like for kids in this area at that time? In this episode, we're going to look at four stories involving children from this area and how they were affected by the Irish Revolution between 1916 and 1922. Our first story is about cows. Who'd have thought cows would feature in the Irish Revolution? Here we are in Pym Street, outside the home of Patrick Walsh, the dairyman in 1916. Well, in Marrowbone Lane, a hundred years ago, there was a big, big building, and it was a distillery. And that's where they make whiskey. A big, big distillery. All around here, the businesses were all about drink. You know Guinnesses around the corner? You all know Guinnesses? So Guinnesses was the biggest brewery, at one time the biggest brewery in the world, in Dublin. And not too far away, we had this distillery called the Marabone Lane Distillery. Now the thing about distilleries and breweries is they're huge buildings. And this is the time when people are living in small houses. So if you're going to cause a rising to happen in the city, you're going to try and take some of the bigger buildings. And why you take the bigger buildings is, you can see for miles around. So one of the buildings they decide to take during the 1916 rising is the Marrowbone Lane Distillery. Now, if you see the 1916 proclamation, I'm sure there's one in the school, have a look at it. The names of the people who signed the 1916 proclamation are all there on it. And one of the names you're going to find is a man called Eamon Kant. Eamon Kant got married in the church here. His name is in the register here. So Eamon Kant is the man in charge in this area. And it's the fourth battalion area that are operating all around here. So they have the things just to remember. They meet the morning of Easter Monday, 24th of April, 1916, and they meet in a place called Emerald Square. Have you ever heard of Emerald Square? Anybody know where it is? No? You know where the Coombe Hospital is in Dolphins Barn? Across the road from that is a group of houses and they're called Emerald Square. That's where they met. So Eamon Kant meets there with his fellow comrades. They're going to have the rising in Dublin and in among them are women. And this is what makes this area even more special because we had loads of women involved in the revolution and they're all local. Some of them were from Basin Lane. They actually lived in Basin Lane. So these are all connected with the rising. So when they get into Emerald Square, they organise, they march all the way down to James's Walk, you know James's Walk along the Dry Canal there? Some of them headed off up to Rialto to go over the bridge and go into the South Dublin Union that way. The rest of them went the other way, as if they were going to school, as if they were going to your school. They turned right, headed down, and they went into the Marabone Lane Distillery. It's going to be nearly a week that they're there. Some of them only brought enough with them for their tea that night. But it turns out that the garrison that was in Marabone Lane was actually going to be the best organised garrison of all the people who took part in the Rising. And the reason was, it's the women. The women were in there with them and organising everything. Oh, we have to get the dinners. Have to make sure everybody's up early, looking after everybody in the place. You're, you're looking at somewhere that hadn't got much food in it. And you have this garrison of people taking part in a rising, making, giving cover to the South Dublin Union because of all the barracks we have around here. Have you ever heard of Richmond Barracks up in Inchicore? That was where a huge number of British military were located and they were going to come into the city the minute the rising started. So the South Dublin Union was really important to try and stop, head that off give the lads in O'Connor Street a chance. How do you feed a garrison of people in a distillery, the back of Maribor Lane, for six days? 
Well, here's one thing that happened. And this is where we bring children into the story. A hundred years ago, you didn't have things like your bottles of milk in the shop. You had dairies, loads of dairies around here. People actually had cows out the back and they milked them and sold the milk to the local people and sold them in a tilly can, that's what it was called. So one such dairy was located in Pym Street. Does anyone know where Pym Street is? You know Marabone Lane Flats? Not too far from there is Pym Street. It's right beside our distillery, believe it or not. So this particular day in the middle of the rising, a young boy is herding a few cows up Marabone Lane. He's bringing them along and there's a bend in the lane. There's actual turn in the lane. So the cows are gone ahead of him. He's probably dragging his feet, a bit bored, bringing the cows back, you know, not, not, not the funnest part of the day, I'm sure. And when he turns around the corner, the cows are gone, gone, vanished. No idea where they are. He knows he's going to be in a pile of trouble when he gets home. He's after losing the cows on the way home, okay? What had actually happened was the garrison in the big building in Marbone Lane spotted the cows coming along. Hungry garrison in the Marbone Lane distillery. Lads, there's a couple of cows wandering up Marbone Lane. What do you think? They opened the gate and they herded the cows into the distillery themselves in the middle of the rising in Dublin. When the women saw the cows, a couple of the cows were milked, so the garrison has milk. Remember, I told you they were really well fed. And then they discover they have a butcher in among the garrison. So the poor old cows are killed and then they're cooped up and everyone has meat. So the garrison in Maribor Lane actually had really good food during the rising. Now we know how much the cows were worth. We even know how old the cows were. We also know who owned the cows. And how do we know that? Because Liz and myself have been doing loads of research. So we went digging to see what we could find. After the rising, an awful lot of people put in compensation claims for things that had happened to their property during the rising. One of the persons who puts in a compensation claim is a man called Patrick Walsh who lived in Pym Street in Dublin after the rising he puts in a claim for two one and a half year old yearling cows and he tells us that he's looking for compensation of 26 pounds for the loss of the cows so there's Patrick Walsh's son is a child probably around your own age who was helping out his dad with the dairy in Pym Street. Helping him out, herding the cows back, probably had been brought up for a bit of grazing up the road, up near the barn probably, grazing them up there, bringing them back to Marabone Lane, and he managed to lose them in the middle of the rising as they're making their way down Marabone Lane. It's just to show you how we have a local event involving a local boy who lived in Pym Street, working with his dad, and he gets caught up in the rising in the most unusual of ways. Have any of us any questions on that? If there was no food at the start, how did most of them survive? They were all told to pack a bag. You know, they were told to bring a pack to lunch. They all packed a bag with enough, what they said, provisions for about a day. But when the others were going to places, some of them took, for example, the bakery down in Ring's End. So that's full of bread. So that was an ideal place to go. The hospital, the South Dublin Union, it had food in it. So they found ways of getting use of what was actually there. The local people knew them. A lot of them were their own daughters and sons that were actually involved in this. So people were making arrangements for food to be dropped in anyway because there'd be lulls in the fight and there'd be times when nothing was happening. And then the next time there'd be something happening. So let's say it wasn't planned out brilliantly, but definitely there was uh, ways around it. And it depended on where they actually were. The distillery, it had a continuous water supply. 
So that's a, you know, that would be something that they definitely had. But we know for a fact the garrison in Maribone Lane was the one that was best looked after all through the rising. So let's hear it for the women. You know, they were looking after them. This is St. Catherine's Church, Denora Avenue. And in this church, you'll find a memorial plaque to Violet Pearson, who was killed in a motor accident on the South Circle Road in December 1919. We're going to tell Violet's story. Now, Violet Pearson grew up in Reuben Street. Does everybody know where Reuben Street is? Please say yes, because that's where I'm from. So that's the street I grew up in. Violet's father was a Church of Ireland missionary. He, he would do missions, he would do sermons, he'd be invited to do things in the church. And the church that they're really associated with is St. Catherine's Church in Denor Avenue. So that's the red brick church you can see from the South Circular Road at the top of Denor Avenue. So fast forward into the War of Independence. One of the barracks we have around here was called Wellington Barracks. Now Wellington Barracks today is Griffith College. Griffith College on the South Circle Road, a third level college. But it was an army barracks. So tensions have been rising. January 1919, 1918, it's, it's all building up. So we're becoming more and more garrisoned here after the end of the World War because Britain sends her forces over here. We no longer have the Irish regiments really in Dublin. They're sending more and more troops into Dublin. They make their presence felt because you don't have much motor vehicles around the streets. What you have are horse and cart or people on bicycles or everyone's walking. You don't have many cars. The only motor vehicles we really have are army ones. And they sped around the streets of Dublin. There was loads of incidents of these uh, lorries speeding through Dublin, knocking people down, taking corners on two wheels, you know, the usual, but really frightening for the people of Dublin. One day, Violet is cycling along the South Circular Road, very near Wellington Barracks, Griffith College, on the South Circular. An army motor lorry comes out of the barracks, speeding, and knocks Violet off her bicycle. She's killed. She's an example of one of the local children getting caught up in this conflict because Dublin is now a heavily garrisoned city. So you have speeding army lorries. There's a sense that there's nearly a cover-up going on about what happens with Violet. But her local community are very passionate about the fact that she wouldn't be forgotten. Her school friends are equally passionate that they will make their presence known about how horrified they are at what happens Violet. So there's this amazing newspaper account of Violet's funeral on the South Circular Road. And her schoolmates, your age, lined the South Circular Road from the school all the way to the barracks near Leonard's Corner, the Wellington Barracks, to the scene of the accident as her funeral cortege made its way to Mount Jerome. It's a big, big, long newspaper article, gives you all this detail. So the story of the daughter of a Church of Ireland missionary who lived in Reuben Street and was cycling along the South Circular Road, an area she would have known really, really well, and she's knocked down by a British military lorry coming out of the barracks, is one of those sad stories from the War of Independence that affected someone your age from around here.
next story is about Hannah Keegan, an 11 year old girl who lived in Cork Street. In March 1921, she was bringing the shopping back to her ma and she passed by the laneway that you see here behind me. But in the laneway, the IRA were waiting to ambush a British soldier. Hannah was caught in the crossfire. This is Hannah's story. And if we go on, 1919 is when things were starting to build, as in the way the war was fought, the Dublin Metropolitan Police, or the police force in Dublin, they were the targets of the IRA. It was an assassination war. Um, across the country, the IRA were assassinating the local IRA seamen. But 1920 is the year that changes everything because the British then began to reorganise. And you've got two forces that were raised because the IRA had been so effective against the RIC. You couldn't get police, you couldn't get men to join. So they had to raise a force from outside of Ireland. And I'm sure you've probably heard of them, the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries. Now there are two separate organisations, the Black and Tans were the actual police force. We gave them the nickname the Black and Tans because they had got a shortage of uniforms. The uniforms are mixed and matched. Um, and literally when they landed, the Irish put the nickname on them. Um, it's a general term used against the Crown forces at this time, and they were notorious. But then you have the auxiliaries, or the auxies as they were known. And these were a law unto themselves. Now both groups literally had free reign to do wherever they wanted. Um, they were protected in what they did, but the auxiliaries it is said that these groups were raised from the prisons, they were criminals, they weren't. All of these men had fought in the First World War. The auxiliaries, the distinction with them is they were officers. You have Victoria Cross medal winners here. These were very brave men who had fought in the First World War. They weren't criminals before they got to Ireland. They were criminals when they got here and they were allowed to do whatever they wanted. And it begins to escalate then. 1920 is a dark year in Irish history. Um, you've probably heard of the events at Crow Park, where you have Michael Collins, Bloody Sunday, his men, including Vinnie Bourne, went out that morning and shot the British intelligence officers. The response from the Crown Force was to go out to Crow Park. Again, the only thing that was meant to make the headlines that day was the match between Dublin and Tipperary. They go out to seek revenge for what happened that morning and the first three victims that are killed at Crow Park are three kids. Now, this is the way the war escalates, and in 1921, it does not show any signs of slowing down. It's just getting worse and worse. And the IRA, not only were they targeting policemen and intelligence officers, but they were also targeting ex-British soldiers. Now, there was one such ex-British soldier, a Major Dennis Lahan, and he had been attached to what is now Clancy Barracks, or was Clancy Barracks at Island Bridge but he lived in and around Cork Street. But for some reason, the IRA wants to get him, he wants to assassinate him, I don't know why. And you have this little girl called Hannah Keegan, and like we all did for our parents, she was sent out to get the shopping. So she lives on Cork Street, and the shop that she had to go to was in Francis Street. So she went down, this is sometime in the evening, so she's getting the, the, the shopping for, the groceries for the dinner. Unfortunately, as Hannah makes her way back to her home in Cork Street, she was literally a few, few metres away from her home. Major, ex major Sergeant Major Dennis Lahan, he's seen on Cork Street, and who was waiting for him were members of the IRA. Now, do you know where Weaver Park is, the new park that we have on Cork Street? So across from that was the post office. And there's a gate, and the gate is still there, Cathy. Yeah? It's still there. Mm -hmm. So that's where the IRA are waiting for Dennis Lahan. They see him, they open fire. But then you have, at that very same moment, Hannah Keegan is making her way across the road. A man called Brady is also in the vicinity. The three of them are shot. And Hannah was killed. But in relation to that story, when they reported that the IRA have shot this ex-Sergeant Major, Dennis Lahan, scroll down and you see this beautiful photograph of Hannah Keegan. And the newspaper reports that Hannah was going to the shop for her man's shopping. She was just about to get into her front door when she was caught in this battle. And it was green peas and sugar that her ma had asked her to buy. 
and that was a young girl that was just going about her everyday business and she never, ever got home. And I suppose what these two stories show is that, again, there is all of these different elements that tell the story of the Irish Revolution, but kids are central to those stories. They were victims, they were participants, they were witnesses, but we cannot ignore their stories when we look at the Irish Revolution. Um, has anyone any questions for myself and Cathy? Did Britain have any control over the Irish newspapers and what news was getting to the Irish? Now, the thing is, as we see today, that what has been reported in the news, the stories, is not what's actually happening in the world. So we're only getting what you know, the government wants us to, to get. And that was happening way back in 1920. So what the IRA did was they produced their own newspaper, the Irish Bulletin because the British government were controlling what was being reported. And you had to report, the newspapers had to report that the IRA were murderers, that they were assassins, whereas the British were, you know, this is all good, clean fun, basically, you know. It wasn't happening. So the Irish Bulletin is produced in 1919, November 1919, and they had to print it on the run. So you've got these girls, um, you have Erskine Childers, Desmond Fitzgerald, but you have a girl called Kathleen McKenna Napoli. And her witness statement is fantastic because she talks about how they printed this on the run. So the print press was huge. They had to rent all these offices various offices around the city because they'd get an office next to all it'd be raided by the military they'd have to move on at one stage she's printing in her house our dad didn't know then the house was raided so you can imagine our, our dad's shock at you know the military storming into the house and they what they were reporting was what was actually happening in ireland and they would produce it five times a week it was translated into Spanish, French, whatever you had, um, Republican sort of uh, consuls across Europe because the Republican network was huge. So they were spreading the word right across the world. America, it was sent to America. And in addition, it was never ever seized, even though the fact that the British, the auxiliaries, when one raid, they got the printing press and they decided to print their own version. But the girls were new, that the print press had been seized. So they put out a special edition saying, there's going to be a fake edition, and this is the diff how you tell the difference between the real and the fake one. So the Irish Bulletin counteracted what the official media were saying. So fake news, it was, it was in existence way back then. Um, as we find history repeats itself all the time. is Claus Barber shop on Mead Street and in 1920 this was Mrs Bourne's stationery shop. Now three local lads made the Kerry newspaper in January 1921 for a very unusual reason and our next story is going to tell you why. I was doing a talk for uh, Kerry, right? So all these events were happening. The war was raging all over the country. I'm looking at all of this and I'm going, there has to be something good that happened or something funny that happened in 1920. It can't all be just death. And I'm looking through the newspapers and I find in a Kerry newspaper, a story about the liberties, a story about Mead Street and a story about kids. And I'm going, what the hell is a story about Mead Street doing in the Kerry newspaper? It wasn't even in a Dublin newspaper, it was a Kerry newspaper. And what had happened was, this shows how the war impacted on kids, because we tend to only think of the adults as the one who suffered, and who suffered mental trauma as a result of what they saw and what they did. But the kids were living amongst all this. The kids were seeing houses being burnt. The kids were witness to the military smashing down the doors because that was life at that time. But no one tends to think of what impact that had on kids. So what you have is three boys from around Mead Street, from Ash Street, from the Coombe, and from Mead Place. That was the other one, wasn't it? And they're all 11, 12 years old. Chris Haslam, Leo McCabe, and John Rafferty. We got the names, we remember the names. And they'd made up this game called We Are the Black and Tans. 
So these young fellas, reading about what was going on, um, seeing what was going on, decided that they were going to pretend to be black and tans. So they found, they walked down Main Street, and they went to Mrs. Bourne's stationery shop, which was on num number 94 Main Street, and they decided to smash our window, because they were pretending to be black and tans, and they had a song. We are black and tans, come on, let's smash the windows, threw a brick or whatever through a window and smashed it. Now the kids weren't taken to court, their dads were taken to court. Now, their dads had to pay the fine. They had to pay Mrs. Bourne to replace her window. And I'd say they got battered by their dads when their dads came home because money, it was, it was a luxury. And I'd say their dads had a lot more important things to spend their money on rather than fixing or replacing a window that their young fellas had smashed. But what this shows, and I was talking to Cathy about this, like from that one little newspaper article, we discovered where those young, young fellas lived. Um, and also in the census records, what their dads did. Like, there's so much thing. And you know what? The shop is still there. It's actually still on Mead Street. Do you know, coming down Mead Street, Baker's Pub, on the right-hand side, when you come round to Thomas Street. So do you know where Kathleen sells the flowers? Yeah. yeah? So right beside, just as you, before you come down to Kathleen on the right-hand side, there's the Algerian barbers. That's Mrs. Bourne's stationery shop. So has anyone any questions for myself or Cathy? Yeah, yourself over there. Why would the three boys want to recreate like the black and tan? So kids are like sponges. See, kids, there's often this sort of idea that kids don't take in anything. Kids are unaware of what's going on. Kids are really intelligent and kids notice an awful lot. Adults tend to talk around kids, not thinking that the kids are listening. So the kids were hearing their fathers and mothers talking about, oh my God, there's another village that's been destroyed by the black and tans. Oh my God, there was another person taken out of their house. So the kids are taking this in. And I suppose the only way that the kids, they, they don't necessarily understand the whole thing, what's happening. So kids tend to deal with things by maybe play, making a game out of it. And I suppose it's a way of kids trying to understand the, the very, very complicated and traumatic events. Um, so you have to try and find a humour where you can, and that's what those kids were doing. Um, I suppose what that story shows is, is that the kids just didn't die in the revolution. There's much more to the story. Um, you don't just have the story of Ireland's freedom being made by the big names, right? You cannot have the Irish Revolution without the likes of the Cooneys, without the likes of um, Con Colbert, Eamon Kant, Cattle Brewer, all of these people, and then the even bigger names. And all of these events took place on our streets. It wasn't just down in Bale Blah where Collins was shot or the GP on O'Connell Street. I can guarantee you now, you can walk any street in the Liberties and you'll find some connection to the East Horizon, the War of Independence, the Civil War. And what, what we hope to show that by talking to you like this, by showing you the rich history of your community, that you are part of something. Our streets are part of something. Our streets are part of the national story. The people who went before us are part of the national story. And they are just as important as the Michael Collinses or the Eamon de Valera's because you couldn't have had it without those people. These four stories show how the children of the Liberties and the surrounding areas were part of the Irish Revolution. The children of Dublin 8, they were victims, they were participants, but they were also witnesses to the revolution.